Hello, my name is Mark Taylor. I'm a retired lieutenant with the City of Orlando Fire Department. I did uh, 20 years on the job. I was a third generation firefighter. I retired out in 2006. And I left because I was just so burnt out. I, was, I knew God was calling me to do something different anyway. I didn't know what that was. I knew it wasn't called to be a pastor. My grandfather on my dad's side was a Baptist preacher. And my great grandfather, his dad was a Baptist preacher. He actually traveled the mountains of North Carolina and Tennessee spreading the gospel on foot. Uh, I'm not called to be a pastor. I don't have that uh, patience, if you will, <laughs> with people sometimes. Uh, I, I didn't know at the time what it was. I just knew he was calling me to do something different. So I, I left. I just, I physically, I could not, and mentally, I couldn't take anymore. So when I left, I was just emotionally uh, and physically just drained. 2006, when I retired, I started getting visitations um, for like three years. There were times when, um, like I'll just, I'll give a couple instances. I was laying in the bed uh, one morning. My wife had left for work. Just as she had walked out, I felt the mattress go down and something crawl up on me. And I thought, didn't I just let my dog out a little while ago? I thought it was my dog, you know? And then I realized I felt it breathing on the back of my neck. You always ask that spirit, whatever it is that's standing there next to you, or like in my case was on me or whatever it was, is who is the Lord Jesus to you? And if they spit and sputter, it's, it's time to start getting them out of there uh, because they, they can't really say the name of Jesus. If it's an angel of the Lord, and you say, who is the Lord Jesus to you? And they give you this glorious answer, like he is the son of the most high God who came to save the sins of the world. You know, this gives you this glorious answer. I mean, it's, you know, you have an angel of the Lord. So this went on for like three, four years. And there were times I was getting two and three visitations a morning. Um, I had one, one morning where I had one crawl on top of me. I felt the mattress go down. He's breathing on the back of my neck. And he said, I'm going to F you up. I actually said the word, and I'm not going to say it on camera. Uh, and I'm like, no, you're not. And I just started trying to cast them out. And it would always get into this like physical type thing in the spirit where I'd have them by the throat or they'd have me by the throat where I couldn't talk. So I'd taken this to someone, to another master interpreter, and they said, yeah, Mark, the Lord's trying to tell you you need to start handling this stuff more in a spiritual realm. He's trying to teach you to handle this more in the spiritual realm, not in the physical realm like you're used to doing in the street, so to speak. And so it was then I started searching out, you know, even more, you know, what, you know, what is going on? And it wasn't until I had found... Melissa Leggett. I'd gone through a ton of inner healing stuff uh, through uh, other ministries, inner healing, because I knew I needed it. I had trauma in my own life uh, with my family, so I knew I had to, to, to clear my heart of a lot of that stuff. So I'd been through a lot of inner healing. That's, that's what was stumping me, if you will. You know what I mean? I, I couldn't figure it out. You know, okay, Lord, what is the problem here? You know, it's like, okay, I've done through all this inner healing, and I still have this stuff going on. Nobody can explain to me what's going on here. What until I met Melissa uh, at uh, the ministry she was affiliated with through Generational Deliverance, that I'd gone to her, that I started learning about Generational Deliverance. In the Bible, a generational curse is defined. It says the sins of the fathers are visited to the third and fourth generation. That goes back to having something running in your bloodline, a tendency to do something over and over. So I would say a generational curse is something that is plaguing you. If there's certain things that are happening to you over and over, the same type of thing, maybe something happened to you that happened to grandma, uh, those things are kind of tendencies for those things to rise up. It's usually a sign there could be a generational curse somewhere. So when I'm on a call for doing prayer ministry with a client, they may be telling me the areas of their life that are really bad, some area that they believe that they would like God to touch. As they start talking to me, the Lord will reveal it in my heart, maybe something that has gone on that empowered that evil. And when I get that feeling in my spirit, and I know that the Lord is, is kind of drawing me to that, I will then turn it into a prayer for them, for them to stand in for their family and repent for whatever that might have been that opened that door. Mark Taylor had gotten a lot of opposition in his life. And in our prayer session, the Lord revealed it that there was a Freemasonry curse on his family. And when we first started getting to the bottom of that, um, it takes time to do that. We had to dig it up. And when we finally got to the root of that issue, he ended up with a major confirmation in the physical realm that that curse had been broken. Now, I've never been a Mason, but I have Masonry in my family bloodline. We all do. There's no way of getting around it. And so I'd gone to Melissa, and uh, she got a second intercessor in there. It wasn't until that day that we actually got a breakthrough. And... Uh, we saw that 
someone in my family had placed a Masonic curse on me because, you know, they'll use you as a mock sacrifice. Interesting thing was that God gave a sign uh, that day. Five minutes before the phone call had taken place, I was in my office in there and I was praying, getting ready. And my mom and dad used to live next door. And so uh, it was five minutes before the phone call. It was a clear day like today. And out of nowhere, lightning struck and struck between me and my mom and dad's house. I mean, it rocked both places. And I knew the Lord was, was giving me a sign that he's fixing to strike my enemies down. And when we had gone into that intercession uh, with Melissa and her other intercessor, it's like the Lord just started just like boom, boom, boom. And we started hammering it and started seeing things and started, you know, uh, dealing with these issues, this, this Masonic curse. It was at that point, literally at that point, it stopped. The visitations stopped at that point. Now, at that point, I was also a lot more experienced at that point. We're like four or five years into this. And it was at that point that that generational curse was broken that all of that stuff stopped. The enemy is a legalist. He does things. He's very intellectually minded, and he's also a legalist. So he is sticking to the legal right. And he is only doing to you what you have given him authority to do. When people do deliverance, um, that, that's great. That's what we want. You know, we want deliverance, spiritual deliverance. But people always leave out the generational part because they don't think it applies. And it does. I'm a prime example of how it does. I sought out all kinds of deliverance. I got all kinds of deliverance, but yet it was still happening. Why was it still happening? Because there was open doors in my bloodline that the enemy had a legal right to come in and torment. And it wasn't until I took that legal right away and so it takes discernment, someone who has a gift like Melissa, to go in and say, hey, this is what I see happening in your bloodline. This is what's going on. We need to pray it off. Here we go. And we start taking care of it through these, these very detailed and lengthy prayers, a lot of it, uh, especially when it comes to the Masonic. Because there's just, it, it's, the levels of the Masonic is just, it's un, unbelievable. Uh, but uh, it's those open doors that we have to go in and close. But most people want to cast it aside. They don't think that you need to take care of it. When... I tell people now, that's the first thing you probably need to close because a lot of what's going on when you close those generational doors, this other stuff that's happening out here in the natural all the time, certain things will go away. It will stop. Uh, you know, if you're constantly getting things breaking, if you're constantly, uh, your finances are taking a hit, whatever it is, there could be something that your grandmother, your great grandmother, it could be something 15, 20 generations back that happened in your bloodline that needs to be shut. Uh, so people don't realize the importance of that, but I, I can tell you firsthand, from firsthand experience, how important it was for me. My childhood was very pleasant until I turned 12. And when I turned 12, my dad passed away very suddenly. Our life got completely turned around upside down. We were thrown into situational poverty. There was not a whole lot of provision after he passed away. And I just remember there was a lot of shock and trauma at that point in my life. I was in my 30s before I discovered that I could see in the spirit. And I believe that it was shut down in me because of the trauma. And I have brought this up to many people in prayer sessions that have the same similar gifting. When there's a shock or a trauma, it really puts you into a situation where you are operating in your logic. It's, it's survival mode. And that gift is kind of put to the side. You're not able, you're taught to explain things away. Dreams don't matter. Something that you might be getting as a vision, people may call you crazy. Um, we're kind of taught to logically put that gift away. And when we stop doing that and we start paying attention to it, the Lord is usually giving us a message in what we're seeing. And it took a long time for me to discover that. And I didn't get there until I was in my 30s. I do have memories of sensing things when I was younger, not understanding what it was and not learning about it in church. I was in church, I grew up in church, but they didn't teach this. So I do remember waking up one night in the middle of the night, very overcome with fear for a friend of mine, praying over that person and finding out later that they had had a car accident. And I didn't understand that gifting at that time, had no idea what that was, did not know anything about the prophetic, but I knew that my spirit was not happy with what was happening. And 
I needed to pray. And I remember telling my mom, we need to pray for this person right now. And when I did that, come out, find out the next day, that person had had a car accident and they survived. And I believe that it could have been worse if we had not risen up to that and prayed for that person at that time. When my dad passed away, because it was considered hereditary, in my 20s, I ended up with panic attacks thinking I would die that same way. When I found out about generational deliverance, that was the very, very first thing I wanted to deal with, is how do we break that off? How can that no longer be the curse there? And I had to get in there and dig up those roots. And once we do that and you get to the root of it and it's repented for, those things don't have the same control they did. And that's where I believe that generational prayer is very key. It it's all stems from repentance and us having our right heart towards God. Melissa's got a huge gift. She's got uh, a gift of discernment like nobody I've ever met. Uh, she can go in basically and discern what's going on in your bloodline, whether it's a Masonic curse or whether it's this, whether it's that. Uh, and then she just takes it before the Lord and we pray it off, you know. Uh, but I think the key to all of this is, is having discernment, you know, being able to discern what's going on, have the Lord show you what's going on. I think that's where people make a lot of mistakes in the deliverance. Discernment is the, the ability to discern the spirit behind a thing. Um, it's the ability to know the difference between good and evil. Not everything that is good is God. And I love that idea because we think a lot of times just because something is good that we should just get a, to be a part of it. When you're using the gift of discernment, you're able to separate if that's really what God wants you to do. And if it truly is coming in the spirit of goodness, it's not always, it's not always coming in the right spirit. Somehow the Lord has released your five spiritual senses to help you understand what might be going on or what he might be saying. And those of us that have the gift of discernment have learned to recognize all of that. And we're using our spiritual senses to figure out what God is saying. The five spiritual senses are very similar to what they are in the physical. It's taste, touch, see, hear, and smell. And anybody that's walking in the gift of discernment has the ability to have that in the spirit realm. So like, for instance, I'll give you an example. When I was working in youth ministry, we were in the living room one night and started smelling sulfur. And the sulfur would not stay in one part of the room. It would move around. And when we started getting together, asking the Lord what was going on, the Lord revealed that it was a spirit in the room. That was our smell, our sense of smell the Lord was activating at that time so that we could know there was something going on. Other people around you may not get that, um, but it becomes one of the things that you connect to with God so that you can build your intimate relationship with him so he can communicate with you and you understand what he's saying. So that becomes a very important part of your walk with the Lord is your ability to hear from him yourself. And in our world, they don't teach you that. In, in the world, they're teaching you, if it's not logical, don't do it. They want you to go on what you're thinking in your mind instead of what your senses are. And most of the time, we're shut down to that. And it takes a little work. In Hebrews, it tells us constant practice, train our senses to know the difference between good and evil. And through time, he will give you those answers. He will help you have the ability to hear his voice more clearly. Mark has a lot of integrity. Mark cares about the people. And I think that's not something you see a lot in a prophet. Prophets really are, you know, kind of quick to say, call things out. And a lot of times you have to learn over the years how to speak that in love. When you're speaking the truth, it doesn't come naturally to a prophet to do that in love. And Mark genuinely cares about the people when he's speaking to them. You know, it's, it's, it's someone who, it's an oracle through God who, where he speaks, you know, uh, a mouthpiece, if you will. To me, it's not something to take lightly. If you hold the office of a prophet, so to speak, um, it is something that, uh, you know, even though I don't call myself a prophet, I'm a prophetic voice, I still take it very serious. Uh, I just don't want to lead people in the wrong direction. So Mark Taylor and I do a lot of intercession together. If there's something that he's getting, he doesn't understand, and needs a little more discernment, we come together and ask the Lord for more insight into what might be, what the Lord might be trying to say. Like, let's say something's happening in the news, and he gets a gut feeling that 
that's prophetic, that there's something going on. We will get on the phone and pray into it and see if there's more that we need to understand about that, if there's anything the Lord wants to reveal, or in some cases, if there's anything we need to repent for. Because one thing about Mark and I, we're doing a lot of repenting for the things that the Lord reveals in the nation. And we do that on our calls too. That's pretty much our focus is target focus repentance. So we have to discern a lot of things that the Lord might be showing us. If our spirit is saying there's some kind of prophetic insight into this, then we do have to usually get on the phone and try to understand what the Lord might be saying in it. So before I read the prophecies, uh, I want everyone to, to know that even my preconceived ideas of how something's going to come to pass is not necessarily how it's going to happen. So I might give my opinion on some things in these prophecies, but that doesn't necessarily mean that is the prophecy. So, uh, because, and I'll, I'll go through some examples once we start talking about this first prophecy on that. Purging the temple, and it was written April 26, 2016. And it says, the Spirit of God says, the 501c3, the 501c3, those that are eating of it are not eating from my tree. For when I told Adam and Eve, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for you shall surely see. So it is with those that eat from the 501c3. For this demonic document that you have signed has now made you spiritually deaf, mute, and blind. Woe to those who continue to use this demonic system, for you will be exposed and purged from this evil cistern. The Spirit of God says, can you not see that you are taking a bribe? They will say it's all about the money, and for that you shall be kicked from my tribe. Taking a bite from that apple has taken you from a spiritual body to a brick and mortar, and has placed you under the new world order. For how can you be a part of my spiritual body when you have cut off my head? For those that do not turn will surely fall as dead. Tear up the contract, repent, divorce Baal, and remarry me, and I will remove the spiritual blindness so that you can once again see. Come out of this, come out of this before it's too late. For my judgments are on those systems that I hate. Come out now, for I will no longer tolerate. This has been the most controversial prophecy out of all of them that I've written. And I get attacked by major ministries, ministers. Uh, I get people sending me emails because they approach their pastor with this message of the 501c3, and they do not want to hear it. This is their man-made kingdom. If the Lord said you have one way out, one way only, and that is to get rid of all your assets and all your money you've made under the system, and how many would actually do it? Uh, how many would twist and turn Scripture and, you know, to make it fit their narrative? Uh, how many would look at you and say, well, you're a false prophet. That's a false prophetic word. You know, God would never do that. Look at the money. Look at the good we're doing with this. You know, it takes money to keep the lights and cameras on. Yeah, it does. It takes money to keep that entity called a corporation moving. It takes money to keep open a one million square foot building and pay everything that goes with it. It was never designed to be that way. Now, I have had some you know, wonderful people, pastors that have written me and said, hey, thank you for your message. We got out of it. You know, they listened to the prophetic word of what God was saying. It's a very complex subject, the 501c3 is, legally. The point is that the church has a choice. They do not have to be under the thumb of, of the federal government. It's in the Constitution. They're already tax-free. They want the extra incentive because they know people will give just out of getting that tax return. That's not true giving. It is a binding contract. It's a demonic contract. It's like being with the mafia. Once you're in, you're in. There's no getting out. And it's going to cost you to come out of it. They, have, they lose their assets. They lose their money. That's how you know it's a demonic contract. And so it's under, under the bail system. The Lord told me, he says, one of the signs that you will see that if a pastor is being controlled by a mammon is if you approach them about the 501c3 and they say, oh, no, it's, it's, that's a good thing. Don't worry about it. That's one of the signs that you'll know that he's being controlled by mammon, basically, if they just deny it completely. Now, I get this argument all the time from people saying, oh, well, I'm, you know, I'll preach on whatever I want. It doesn't matter if I'm a 501c3 or not. It doesn't, you're not understanding. It's not the way it works in the spirit realm. You're, you're being veiled. You're, you're being, uh, the things you are saying, the, the warring that you're doing is not having an effect because you are in covenant with Baal through that system, whether you're incorporated, or the 501c3 especially, and probably close to about 96% of our churches are 501c3s. You know, these pastors, a lot of these guys are not pastors, they're CEOs, and they don't understand that's not the way it was meant to be. When you come out of that system and you are a home congregation, Jesus Christ is now the head of your ministry, which now opens the door. The veil's not there. So you can hear God, you can see God, the signs, wonders, and miracles can now take place. I've had people email me with this equation, if you will, the five plus zero plus one is six. C, three. Three sixes, 666, which is the system. It's strange because on my Twitter feed, I have 
Patton for General Patton in 6966. And I get attacked all the time. Oh, you got three sixes in there. It's the mark of the beast and all this stuff, right? And I tell people, I was like, that was my employee number on the fire department. You get assigned a number. It's like the military. They assign you a number. You can't ask for another one. And I never quite understood. I thought that number was kind of strange, you know, when it was issued to me. And it wasn't until here, like a couple of years ago, the Lord revealed to me what it was. And he said, Mark, he said, notice there's three sixes in it. Yes. He said, but also notice there's a nine that separates them. He said, nine is a number of judgment. And he says, I have called you to prophesy judgment on the systems. That's what that number was about. The church is under judgment because they've been leading people astray for a very long time. And a lot of them aren't even in agreement with what's happening right now with our nation. A lot of them are not praying for our president. And the way I look at it is the only reason why you're mad at dad is because you have skeletons to hide. And he's coming in, exposing all of this. And there's a part of their spirit that's rising up against them because there's something that's not right. God's going to shake it and he's going to tear it down. Uh, it's, it's coming. It's already here. We're seeing headlines every day of, of even like uh, there was an apostle in Southern California who got busted for human trafficking. He had a million followers. Uh, I mean, this does not even scratch the surface. You're going to see ministries. You're going to see churches. You're going to see seminaries where you're going to see human trafficking, uh, sex trafficking. The um, child sacrifice has been going on in these places, and it's going to boggle people's minds. You know, people always want to pick on the Catholics. I tell people, stop picking on the Catholics. I understand that the problems are bad. It's the hierarchy. We've got good people that are Catholics in there, but it's the hierarchy that, that God is after right now that has literally uh, placed curses, as far as I'm concerned, on their congregations. You've got other denominations, Baptists, Methodists, all these guys that are just as bad as the Catholics, but they're better at hiding it right now. And it's all coming out. There was something here a while back uh, from a, a certain denomination I won't mention, but they had close to 10,000 names, if you will, that were like uh, on, on a pedophile list that was never been dealt with. I mean, it was incredible. So, I mean, this is just doesn't even scratch the surface of what's coming. And people better get prepared because justice is not coming. Justice is here. And if you don't, justice can get ugly. You're, you're going to have suicides. You're going to have people going to prison for the rest of their life. And you're going to have executions. The contrast between the pastors of years past compared to today is like a 180. You had the Black Coat Regiment in the Revolutionary War, which the first person to fire a shot in that war was a pastor. These guys would take up literal arms to protect their flock. And in today's time, you don't see that. What you see are pastors protecting their corporation. They will protect their corporation at all costs. It doesn't matter who it hurts. People are getting hurt in the church and that is not okay. I wish the mass exodus would happen faster, honestly, because I think there's so many wounded people out there that they need to know that God still cares about them, even though the church might not have been on their best behavior. Whatever the church may have said about you or done to you is not necessarily what God is saying about you. When you got your eyes on man, you're more, you d man dictates what you do and the way you feel sometimes. When you've got your eyes on God, you know that that is not God's character. God doesn't operate that way. And it excites me that God sees it and he knows it and he's going to deal with it in his way. So this one is called Babylonian Prison and it was done June 12, 2016. And it says, the Spirit of God says, there's a beast in the east that's trying to arise that thinks he's the best. But I have one in the west that will give him a godly surprise and take him down to the least. For this beast that has arisen is no surprise for my church is in a Babylonian prison. Come out of here or it will be your demise. The Spirit of God says, The chaos and clatter that the earth is in is directly related to the Babylonian box that the so-called church is in. For my earth is moaning and groaning for my sons and daughters to arise with bliss. Where is my army that will send this beast back to the abyss? For how can you take on a beast when you're deaf, mute, and blind? For all beasts are ancient and old and lurk about seeking an enemy whom they can steamroll. For this beast has no teeth and lurks in the brush, trying to lure you into an ambush. Do not attack until you come out of her, that Babylonian system, or you will fall prey and be decimated beyond comprehension. The Spirit of God says, For when my people realize the curse they are under and come out, break the curse, then they will plunder. For as they come out of her with a mass exodus, there I will be to restore her back to my body, and I as the head, she will have power, authority, and unity again, and the enemy shall fall as dead. For you wonder why the world is so perverse. It's because my church has forsaken her first love and is under a curse. Come out of her now, don't walk but run, do not wait before you cross the point of no return, for then it's too late. 
Come back to me, come back to me, and make me your first love I have dearly yearned. For some, it's already too late, for they have not learned. This first paragraph, the beast in the east, I, th I think, this is just my opinion, that God's referring to ISIS at the time, right here. And I believe that uh, they've been allowed to arise, these different factions, these beasts, if you will, the ancient spirits that are behind these people, basically, these, these different groups, have been allowed to arise because the church is not doing any warfare. You know, prayer is when we're addressing God, warfare is when you're addressing the enemy. And they don't talk about spiritual warfare in the church anymore. So in the second paragraph, the Lord is, is talking about the Babylonian box that the church is in, the system, basically, and He's telling them to come out of it because you cannot take on a Babylonian beast, you know, Baal, if you will, uh, when you are in covenant with it. And when you do, you're opening the doors for actually to be decimated because it gives legal right for an enemy to come in. You can't take down an enemy you're in covenant with. So when you do that, He's saying right here, if you come out of it, you repent, divorce Baal, remarry God, now you can take on that entity, so to speak, but the church won't do it. I call the church the system. I call the army of God the congregation of God. The army of God is the remnant because the system has oppressed people for so long. It's all about control. It's all about manipulating people. It's not having people think for themselves. And we have good people in the system that we're trying to educate and rescue and get them out of there and get them in the remnant. I believe that those systems were in a perfect position to take care of people better than our government could, and they didn't do that. And now God has stepped in and has had to change some things. And he's probably given all of them an opportunity to repent. God doesn't just go in and cut you off. You've had a warning or two. God is a very patient God. And for him to come now and be basically judging, he's done with it. God sees it. He sees the exploitation all the way across the board in any of the churches. When Jesus went up on the mountain and Satan was tempting him, and he, he showed him all the kingdoms of this earth, there's a part of me that believes that that was also the systems because it's the systems is where all the money, all the wealth, the influence, all of that stuff exists. And it's part of that Babylonian ancient spirits, if you will. So this next prophecy is called The Lost Art of War, and it was written December 12, 2016. Uh, it says, The Spirit of God says, Why are my people not repenting? You use generalized repentance, which has little to no effect, when you should be using target-focused repentance and prayer. You don't use target-focused repentance because of your pride. Your haughty spirits and attitudes have caused you to fall into the enemy's pit. You're afraid of target-focused repentance because you will have to admit there is fault with you and your congregation. By not repenting, this is an abomination. My people have lost the art of war, for any true warrior of mine knows that waging an effective warfare starts with target-focused repentance and prayer. The Spirit of God says, Woe, woe, woe to you leaders that have led my people astray. You who are cowardly and afraid of offending have sacrificed my truth and my people on the altar of mammon. Repent now, or you will not come out of that pit, for truly you have received your reward, and that's all you will get. You honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. Because of your pride and refusal to repent, there will be no hiding from this judgment. It's upon my church, especially the leadership. Your big fancy homes, clothes, and cars were made with money stained with innocent blood. This has allowed the enemy to come in on you like a flood. Even the Pharisees knew not to touch that money, but woe to you that continue to take it, saying, it's as sweet as honey. The blood, the blood which cries out to me day and night, from the aborted babies to the murdering of my prophets. The blood is on my church's hands, and yet no repentance. I am looking for my true love, my pure spotless bride, and it grieves me her garments are stained because of pride. Where is she? Where is she, my true love? I can no longer wait. My judgment is upon you. Repent and come back to me before it's too late. Generalized repentance is not going to cut it anymore. It's going to take target focus where you laser designate the target and you, you get very um, specific on what you're trying to repent for. What is that sin you're trying to repent for on behalf of the people or the land that you're on? So the Bible says that if the people that are called by His name would humble themselves and pray, turn from their wicked ways, that's the repentance part, then the Lord will hear, hear from heaven and heal their land. Land is always, to me, it's always representation of inheritance. So if you want your inheritance healed, you have to repent. And sometimes it's just that acknowledgement that our, you know, we're not perfect, something happened. The Lord appreciates that. He hears that and he will honor that in our lives. 
it's important from a standpoint that people have to realize, you know, what is it going to take to turn our country around? And that's, you know, that scripture talks about all of that, you know, if we humble ourselves and seek God, you know, he will heal our land. And so we've done a lot of that. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. They don't see it going on in the church system, so to speak. But this is where the national prayer calls that we do, the international prayer calls, let's just start calling it international now the international home groups that we're doing. This is where the remnant, the army of God, I call it, uh, is really stepping up the fight. You know, in Nineveh, when the king called for a day of repentance, I mean, it, it changed the city overnight. You know, I'd love to see the president declare a day of repentance. Uh, and, you know, we always do a national day of prayer. There's nothing wrong with that. But they always say uh, prayer, fasting, and repentance. And repentance always gets left at the end. And generally, there's no repenting that gets done, if you notice. Uh, it's always a generalized repentance. Lord, forgive us for our sins. Well, that's not what the Lord wants. If there's a certain issue that just keeps happening and happening, uh, voter fraud, for instance, we repent for voter fraud. We are getting to the root of these issues that are coming up. And our goal is to make sure that we cover it. Someone needs to stand in the gap for the areas where our state or our country has been lacking. And that's what we're doing in prayer. We're meeting with the Lord and telling him that we don't agree with what's been going on and we're asking him to reverse it. You know, could it be something that's happened on the land, abortion on the land or whatever it is? You wanna get very technical with it. Laser designate the target and you go after it through repenting for on behalf of the people in the land. And prayer, you know, prayer's when we're addressing God, warfare's when we're addressing the enemy. You know, but repentance is something that you take the legal right away from the enemy to basically exist, if you will. In the second paragraph of this prophecy, the Lord's talking about how the judgment is upon the church, but especially the leadership. It's all about the big fancy homes. It's about the clothes, the cars. It's made with the money off the blood of those innocent babies, basically. The Pharisees knew not to take that money from Judas. They wouldn't even take that money. They said, no, we're not taking that money. That's blood money. Even the Pharisees knew not to take that. You know, the Democrats, these liberals, have literally duped and deceived the population into thinking that it's about a woman's right to choose or it's about women's health. Folks, it's not about any of that. You've been deceived, you've been duped. It is literally about one thing, is to get you to abort that baby because that is a sacrifice under their God called Baal or Moloch. Moloch falls under Baal. But it's to empower their entities that they serve. When you abort that baby, it's going into the arms of Jesus, period. And God will forgive for anyone that's had an abortion. But what I want to try to do is to open people's eyes and ears to any woman out there who's thinking of having an abortion because she believes it's a woman's right to choose or it's about woman's health. It's about none of that. It's about sacrificing your child, which is what they want you to do, and empowering their, that entity called Baal over America, or Moloch, is what they want. And that's what it's all about. The next prophecy is spiritual treason, and it was March of 3rd of 2017. And it says, the Spirit of God says, why are my people attacking one another? Why are my people engaging in friendly fire? Friendly fire will not be tolerated. Just because you disagree with that person doesn't give you the right to murder that person with your words. Thou shalt not murder. Repent. You will be held accountable for every word you speak. The religious, legalistic, and critical spirits that are on my people are creating division and chaos. Can you not see that you are being used by the kingdom of darkness? You are aiding the enemy. How can you take on an enemy that you are a part of? You are using my written word as an intellectual weapon against my people, you brood of vipers. My written word was meant to be wielded against the enemy, not the people of God. Repent. You who commit spiritual treason. You think because you know my written word that you know me, but your hearts are far from me. Your intellect, your so-called knowledge has created a spiritual arrogance, and your pride is separating you from me. If the written word was alive in you, you would not use it to attack my people. Repent. The Spirit of God says, where is the sound of unity? Where is the mercy and grace that I have shown you? Why are you not showing it to others? Why has your love grown cold? Put your petty differences aside. My love is unconditional. Love each other deeply. Love covers a multitude of sins and my mercy endures forever. The love, mercy, grace, and unity that I am looking for will be what it takes in these days ahead to push back the forces of darkness so my gospel can go forth. These attributes are what's needed to be a part of my army. I am looking for men and women of God to put their differences aside Come together in unity for this common cause and forwarding my kingdom. My army is making great strides against the kingdom of darkness, taking ground, holding ground. They will be an unstoppable force in the days ahead. Unify, unify, unify. I am calling all my troops to unify now.
So spiritual treason is, treason of the natural would be like betraying your country, it would be uh, trying to take down your country, working against your country. And so spiritual treason is when you're working against the kingdom of heaven, when you're working against the kingdom of God, and you're actually aiding the kingdom of darkness. He's tired of the people using the word of God, attacking one another. You know, it's friendly fire. Uh, it, it's amazing because we live in such a militant society right now. When you disagree with someone, you become their mortal enemy. And it has that same uh, attitude is transferred to the people of God, basically, where they'll shoot somebody in that foxhole with them. You know, when the Lord talks about thou shalt not murder, people think that it's taking a life, if you will, in the physical. Well, there's such a thing as doing it in the spiritual. That's why it's called character assassination, because you're murdering people with your words. And the Lord's very serious when he says, I'm going to hold you accountable for every word that you speak. Yes, we're going to have disagreements. Uh, we're not going to always 100% agree on everything, but that doesn't mean that you're my enemy, you know? We, we should go back to the days when we could disagree on something, lovingly agree to disagree, but you part as still brothers and sisters in Christ. That's where the Lord is calling us to be right there. The clergy response team uh, was put together under FEMA. We don't know the exact amount. It was 28,000 at one point, uh, and then it had grown to something over that. I don't know what the numbers are now or were. Um, I don't know if that's still enacted or not, uh, but at some point, these pastors literally sold out their flock for their own safety. It was designed that in times of natural disaster, you would get your flock under control, you would get them to submit their guns to the government, they would literally lead the government to your home. They were to control their flock, basically, and they were going to basically take your family uh, under the direction of your pastor, who was involved in all of this, and lead you to a FEMA internment camp. They had a whistleblower come out and expose all of this. He actually had the uh, handbook that they were giving him and what they were supposed to do. He didn't like what he was seeing, and so he exposed a lot of this, and it just went dark. The Lord's been telling me, federal agents in the pulpit posing as pastors, and we don't know who they are. That's the scary part. They are there to log everything that goes on in their congregation and report it to the feds. And under Obama, this was really bad. And under Clinton, was, this is where they're going to activate. Everything was going to get activated under Clinton. That's what people don't understand. It was a process of getting things in place through Bush, Obama, and then it was going to be activated under Hillary. And that's the kind of things that you saw happening in Nazi Germany at the time in World War II. People selling people out like that and turning them over to the Gestapo. That to me is treason, period. And so that's the clergy response team in a nutshell. Where it's at today, I don't know because nobody can get any information on it. it only, only the whistleblower was able to bring forth that information. If they ever release that information, I think it's going to astound people who's on that list, number one. But number two, how many of them are on that list? That's, that's, the, that's the bad part right there. It's because you don't know who's in the pulpit. Spiritual warfare is when you're addressing the enemy. Prayer is when you're addressing God. So if you're going after the enemy, you're using all of your weapons of warfare that you have to get rid of an entity, to bind an entity. Uh, you know, to me, repentance is probably the, one of the highest forms of spiritual warfare. I try to explain it this way. Uh, here in Florida, you know, we have a right to shoot someone who comes in our house. So if someone knocks on my door and I invite him in and all of a sudden he pulls a gun on me or gives me a hard time, and I ask him to leave. No, I'm not going to leave. Well, why won't you leave? Because you invited me in. He has a legal right to be there. I invited him in. Repentance stops that. So that now when I do repentance and I take that legal right away, he comes in my door unannounced. I have the right to take care of it however I see fit, whether it's deadly force or whatever it is. That's, I know that's kind of a hard of analogy, but that's the way it kind of works, is that when you take the legal right away, now you can go in and you can do damage to the enemy. That's the point I'm trying to make here. Spiritual warfare is something people experience when the enemy's not happy with them. Either they've got some major open doors and the enemy is coming after them and they need to do some repenting and get their heart right with the Lord, or they're getting retaliated against for walking with the Lord. And those spiritual attacks are what we have authority to come against. We don't have to put up with that. In the Christian walk with the Lord, you do not have to put up with that. So spiritual warfare is an opportunity for us to figure out why that door is open, why they have the right, and close it. And it hit me, you know, in John it talks about where they were going to stone the Lord, and he hid himself and slid out. And the Lord says, well, you know, if you can do 
you'll do the things that I did, but also greater things. Well, if he can do that, we can do it. So the Lord gave me this prayer where it's like, Lord, I, I release your heavenly host and your warring angels to jam the enemy's radar and scramble his frequencies. And so I put that on my website where people can download it. And so we can do that. We can scramble the enemy's frequencies. We can, we can scramble his radar. We can jam it. And he cannot detect what's going on. He can't hear what's going on. He can't see what's going on, uh, just like Jesus did. And so, I mean, uh, so before you do any warfare, that's what I tell people, do the enemy's radar prayer first. Scramble his frequencies, because if you don't, he's setting up for you coming. And it's like, uh, and you don't want that. You don't want to tell the enemy what you're doing. You want to ambush the enemy, which is what you do when you do this uh, scrambling the enemy's radar prayer. Years ago, the Lord told me there was three reasons for warfare, spiritual warfare. One was a sin in your own life, something that you continually do that you have not gotten taken care of, or a sin in your family line where they had tendencies that basically they squandered away their inheritance. And the third one was retaliation for serving the Lord. And he told me there's the two that you have control over, the sin in your life and the sin in your family, you can take care of that and close those doors. And then you ask the Lord to take care of the one that is retaliation for serving him. I believe the church has gone wrong with spiritual warfare because they don't check their hearts first for doing something. And when you have open doors in your own life, if you have sin in your own life and you try to come against that without taking care of what's in your heart, and what doors you have open, you give the enemy the right to come after you instead of you being effective in that spiritual warfare. And I believe that there's a lot going on there. There's a lot of pastors that have taught us that we just have authority. And the truth is we do, but we can't cast out Satan with Satan. And that's not going to work as effectively as if you make sure that your heart is right. I am forever always repenting for anything that I might have done to step out of my authority I try to make sure my heart is right with the Lord first. So the next one is uh, called Shatter and Scatter, and it was written uh, June 12, 2016. And it says, The Spirit of God says the Illuminati and ISIS have merged and are attacking the pulse of this nation, for they are responsible for the list of assassinations. For the new world order is shaking and quaking, for they will go down in flames of blazing. For they are trying to kill this nation before my chosen one takes office through depopulation, finances, and assassination. My army, my intercessors, arise and take the fight to the enemy. Stop the assassinations. Stop the attacks to the pulse of this nation. The Spirit of God says the Illuminati. I, the Lord God, shall expose the Illuminati because of who they want to be. They shall say we will be the world leaders like a shot. Not so fast, for I, the Lord God, shall shatter you like a clay pot. Shattered and scattered, my wind will send you back to the one who sent you. For you think you are wise, craving power, money, and the prize. You so-called wise have been fooled by the lust and the lure of the prize to the point that the one who sent you now seeks his payment. And this too, you will soon realize. For your days are numbered and short. Woe to you when you have to stand before him and report. For this will be for all to see when you serve the God of this world, it will bring you low. Repent, or you shall be cast into the fire below. The Spirit of God says, Why do the prophets of doom and gloom keep saying that this is the end? For they are misreading this season of time we are in. For those that keep speaking this with words that bend are aiding the enemy, making the people lay down their arms, give up, lose hope, stop fighting, and saying we will just ride this out to the end. For you are never to stop fighting or lay down your arms for any reason. Stop listening to those who commit spiritual treason. For life and death are in the power of the tongue, for this treasonous talk is even affecting the young. Stop aiding the enemy and start talking about what I, the Lord God, and my army are going to do. Grab the enemy by the throat and make him fluster. Look him in the eyes and say, is that all you can muster? Choose this day whom you will serve, for I have given you the victory and the choice is yours. Your Supreme Commander, God. Now in this prophecy, it, at the time, uh, again, this was before the president had come into office, we just had uh, the Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando. There was no coincidence there. He was linked to ISIS somehow. And so this is what the Lord was saying is that ISIS and the Illuminati have merged to basically follow out their assassination orders. And that's what that was. And they were trying to strike at the pulse of the nation at that time to instill fear. In here where it talks about that he's going to shatter the Illuminati like a clay pot. He's going to expose everything behind the Illuminati, which we've been seeing. We've been seeing the cabal. 
uh, all these things are now, he's just going to shatter them to pieces, basically, is what he's saying. And then in the last paragraph here, he talks about, you know, why do the prophets of doom and gloom keep saying this is the end? When you rob people of hope, you rob them of the will to fight. I'm getting emails from people right now uh, that say, you know, hey, Mark, I appreciate your, your message of hope, you know, because I've been addicted to the doom and gloom. I listen to the doom and gloom messages, whether it's the news, whether it's the pastors, whatever. And I was on the verge of committing, I was literally fixing to commit suicide. And it was your message of hope that turned me around and I rededicated my life to Christ. And so the Lord's holding them accountable right here. Stop with the doom and gloom, preach the gospel. The gospel was the good news, period, of Jesus Christ. And I'm a hope agent. You know, I want to instill hope in people that this thing's not over with. We don't know when the Lord's going to come back. He could come back before we finish this. It's not up to us. It's up to when no man will know. Not even Jesus himself will know. But the point being is that we are to fight, continue to fight. God will give us the victory as we fight until that day comes. This was called Satan's Frequency, and this is July 7, 2017, and it says, The Spirit of God says, Why are you tuned into the enemy's frequency? Why aren't you tuned into mine? Why do you listen to the doom and gloom? Do you not realize that they are tuned into the enemy's airwaves? I said, Go throughout all the earth and preach my gospel, the good news. Then why is there so much doom and gloom? Why are you siding and agreeing with the enemy's plans? Repent. You give more airtime to the enemy's plans than mine, thus empowering his plans. Did I not say that life and death are in the power of the tongue? Then speak life. Why are my leaders searing the consciousness of my people with doom and gloom teaching? You who preach doom and gloom are robbing my people of hope and the will to fight. You are no longer saving lives but taking them. How, you might ask. Your doom and gloom messages have robbed them of hope to the point of suicide. You prophets and pastors of doom and gloom now have blood on your hands. You are prophesying your own doom. Repent. The Spirit of God says, the news media, the news media, you have become a stench unto my nostrils. There is no spirit of truth in you. I, the Lord God, will clean out the news media and bring back truth. The sign will be given when news media outlets will go down, bankrupt, and I, the Lord God, will rebuild them using my righteous people to restore them. I am calling on my army and those who are chosen to be my journalists, investors, to get ready to take your place as I tear down and rebuild my news media. The Spirit of God says, where are my billionaires and millionaires? Why are you not buying out these news outlets and taking control? That money I gave you was for my kingdom to advance my kingdom in all areas of influence. Now is the time to move into my news media. I will now take back what belongs to me using my army and the finances I have given them. Rise up my army and take back my news media so the spirit of truth will begin to flow. This is the fight the enemy does not want to see. He has held this stronghold for too long and his time is up. Take this fight to the enemy and my army will be victorious and my media will be brought back to me. The whole Satan's frequency started uh, when they detuned it from 444 to 440. Uh, the international tuning was started, I think it was Rockefeller did a study with the U.S. Navy, and that's when they determined that. But it was the same thing that basically Hitler would do. He would bombard the crowds with these frequencies, if you will, before he would come out and speak. And they would turn it off right before he came out. When they did, they turned it off. It would give this euphoric feeling. So when he came out and spoke from the stage or whatever it was, they were ready to receive whatever it was he spoke. Now, if you transfer that over into the church where you're broadcasting your worship music in these satanic frequencies, what you're doing is you're setting the stage. Uh, both physically and spiritually. You're setting the stage for the people in the congregation to get ready to receive what comes out of the mouth of the whoever it is on the pulpit. And now when the pastor comes out after the music and he begins to speak, it's already spiritually prepared them to hear what it is he has to say in a demonic frequency. They hear the plans of the second heaven, Satan's frequency, and they prophesy if it were the plans of the third heaven, which is not the case. And this is where things, I think, get really messed up. And people have to understand, the leader of a church, the leader of a ministry, the leader, President of the United States, is the, always the gatekeeper of that organization, of that country, of that church. And so if there's an arrogant, prideful, spirit that's on that pastor, it's going to get passed down to the congregation. The second paragraph on this one, the news media, you know, he, he's talking about here that sign will be given where some of these outlets will actually go bankrupt, and we're already seeing that right now. Since this was written in, what, July 7th, 2017, we're seeing some of these outlets go bankrupt, go under because of this. This is why every time you listen to the media or the news, you get agitated. You know, you just can't. It's like, what is that? It's aggravating me. That's why. It's those frequencies. People joke all the time about the zombie apocalypse. And it sounds funny. It's really not because there's a lot of truth to it because their goal is to turn us into a bunch of mindless zombies 
that you know single file line following exactly what they want you to hear, know, and speak, and perceive. And they've been very successful at it to a degree. And this is the part of the Great Awakening where now people are waking up to this uh, and turning the other way now. It, the best thing I can tell people to do is turn off the mainstream media. I tell people go straight to the, to the president's Twitter feed, listen to him directly because you're getting the truth straight from the source. I think a lot of times, well, a lot of times people put God in a box, whether it's their religious views, whether it's views that they can't use someone that's not educated, uh, or whatever it is. Because I, I get people attacking me all the time, well, who's this firefighter? You know, I've been doing this 30, 40 years, and this guy comes along out of nowhere, you know? That's the kind of mentality that God's crushing right now, because he wants the everyday person to do this. So don't put God in a box. And when you put God in a box, God was in the Ark of the Covenant, he came out of the Ark, that was prophetic, don't put me in a box. Jesus was in the tomb. He came out of the tomb, that was prophetic, don't put me in a box. And if God could use me, I was bedridden for four and five days at a time, God can and will use you right where you're at. My thoughts on the current prophetic movement is that God is doing something new in that area and he is speaking his words through people that have not ever been maybe out in the mainstream. He's using people that have been maybe stuck at home, maybe sick. He's using a lot of new voices in the prophetic movement right now. Whistleblowers to me are prophetic. Prophetic person is gonna blow the whistle. So there's a lot of those people and some of them aren't even, I mean, some of them have never been to a training class but they feel compelled to tell on Hillary Clinton. I'm a firm believer that God can use anybody. Uh, I don't have a degree of any kind hanging on the wall. Uh, I got a high school diploma. I was a you know, retired lieutenant with the fire department. Um, if he can use me, he can use anybody. I don't care who it is. You don't need a PhD hanging on your wall. As a matter of fact, I think God's kind of tired of the PhDs because they get too much intellect involved. It actually create what I call a spiritual arrogance. I've seen it too many times, time and time again, uh, especially some of these big name leaders. Um, it just creates this arrogance, if you will. And God is, is wanting to use right now the everyday common person. You have to have a balance of knowledge and wisdom. There's nothing wrong with having intellectual knowledge, but the problem is intellectualism a lot of times is a spiritual killer. And when you get too far-sighted, it creates that spiritual arrogance like we talked about. And that spiritual arrogance will put God in a box every single time. You know, this is the Great Awakening that we always talk about, you know, in the patriotic movement. Some people call it the patriotic movement. I call it, is it the spirit of Elijah that's actually rising on the earth? I think that's what it is. The Lord's been telling me for the last couple of years that there's another showdown coming between the spirit of Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And you're seeing that happening right now. Uh, you're seeing some of these uh, guys get exposed. You don't have to mention names right now. They're outing themselves right now. Whether it's political, whether it's religious, doesn't matter. They're outing themselves as the prophets of Baal believe it or not. I think every time there's a whistleblower blowing the whistle, that is the spirit of Elijah coming against the prophets of Baal, no longer tolerating it. And the Bible did say that he was against those churches because they had tolerated the woman Jezebel. They had tolerated manipulation and control. And it doesn't seem to me like God is tolerating it anymore. You're seeing the spirit of Elijah rising. Even though he hid from Jezebel, it took Jehu coming in and destroying Jezebel totally. Uh, you know, Elijah took care of the prophets, and then Jehu took care of, of um, Jezebel herself. I believe that Donald Trump is a Jehu who will cast Jezebel off. I've said time and time again that when some of these arrests happen, some of them will actually be signs that these spirits have been arrested and will be locked up in the key thrown away. Christians have a problem with like the president's language or his calling people out, calling them names. And it's like, you know, the Lord, Jesus called people names. He called them vipers, he called them snakes. The problem is with the church, is they've become so passive, they've lost the warrior mentality. And then when a warrior, a true warrior shows up on the scene, they get offended. America was in trouble. America was going down in flames. And when people find out just how close we were to losing it, the Lord's been telling me there was a plan in place to literally destroy America. And these guys go underground until after the fact. They were gonna Islamicize America. 
uh, through the 501c3s, Hillary was going to literally come in, I believe, and shut down the churches where they would say, hey, you're going to preach on certain topics. If you don't, we're going to shut you down. And I believe she was going to turn them into a mosque or a satanic temple, either one. The churches were going to lose everything they had. Um, so it's only through the grace of God that they still have what they have through Donald Trump. But we were so close to World War III, which is what they wanted, uh, and destroying America so that the New World Order could come in and uh, take over, basically. They have the one world government, one world religion, and that timeline was stopped through Donald Trump. And people have to understand this. This is not Donald Trump's agenda. This, this is heaven's agenda that he's fulfilling, that he has been commissioned to fulfill, period. If it's not Donald Trump, it will be someone else. You know, and we've got some people who don't even believe in Christ who know more about what's going on than most Christians do. I think there are people in the world right now that may not know the Lord that stand for righteousness. They may not have had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ right now yet, but they are willing to fight for life. They're willing to fight for righteousness. They know the difference between right and wrong, and they're standing up for it. And God is able to use those people because he is not looking for perfection. And even though they may not be in his kingdom yet, it doesn't mean that they won't be. And the Lord told me not too long ago, he said, Mark, this is the great awakening. But he said, this is also the great separating, which you're seeing, uh, because you're seeing the church system over here, you're seeing the remnant over here. And they've got two totally different missions. One's for themselves, one's for Christ over here. There's a lot of people out there that haven't taken the red pill yet. It's, it's hard, you know, when they've been indoctrinated their entire life. They don't want you to think for yourself. All of this was designed to steal man's free will. God gave everyone a gift, and he can never take that gift away, and that's your free will. And so the goal of the Freemasons, the goal of all these people, the cabal, is to steal the free will of man. God is fixing to reopen the free will of man or, or give back the free will of man so that they can now say, choose this day whom you're going to serve. They can't even choose right now, hardly. Literally, because they've been indoctrinated through all of these things, brainwashed, uh, mind controlled through all of these things. When God takes the veil of all of that off, the free will of man will come back and they will be able to make a decision at that point. And it'll be at that point that whether good or bad comes upon, you know, this or that. Michael Ortega is the leader of the Strike Force of Prayer, the national, international prayer call, I should say. Uh, it started off on a national level. I think we've got them all in just about every state in the United States. Some have multiple prayer calls, which is what we want, because we want to get it around the clock in each state. They are praying and repenting on behalf of their state, their city, their town. Again, he's pushing from the prayer standpoint, which to me is taking ground for the kingdom. And then we've got uh, the Omega Kingdom ministry side, which is the home congregation side, which is Russ Wagner and those guys who do a phenomenal job. That's holding the ground. I give this testimony and the one lady said, you know, she says, I went to church for years. I sought out deliverance. I sought out signs, wonders, and miracles, all these things that she sought for uh, in, in her own healing, uh, inner healing and stuff. And she said, it never happened under the church. She said, the second I went into the home congregations and she broke that, she said immediately, she started getting the healing. She started getting the deliverance. And this is where the home congregations, this is where the national prayer calls are taking place because they're not part of the system. This is where I believe the huge flow of signs, wonders, and miracles are going to return. When Jesus said that you will do the things that I did and you will do also greater things, that's where it's gonna start. That's the true New Testament model. And what the Lord showed me one day, you know, there's scripture that talks about when you cast a demon out, it goes out seeking rest, and when it can't find it, it comes back sevenfold worse. The Lord told me, he says, Mark, don't think for one second that doesn't happen geographically. He said, because these churches will come in, they'll have a revival. Take the ground. The enemy goes, sure, you want to come in and have a revival? We'll back off. We won't even give you any opposition. Because they know they won't leave anything in place to hold that ground. So the enemy backs off. They have the revival. And the second they pull out, the enemy comes in sevenfold worse. And if you research and find out where we've had revivals in, in cities past, you'll see that's where all the blue zones are. They've come in and they've dominated that area because they don't leave anything in place to hold that ground. And that's where the home congregations are going to hold that ground now. God is, a, is assembling a team here of people who have impeccable character and integrity. And it's just, it's mind blowing at the time, same time it's very humbling to think that God would use everyday common people to achieve extraordinary acts, if you will. And I think that's what you're, that's what you're fixing to see. It's already happening.
A lot of this stuff that the Lord has revealed isn't going to happen just without us doing something. We need to be praying His will. We need to continue trying to turn things around. And there's a bigger picture here because God has people that have never heard of Him. They may never have heard about Jesus. They may be in a village somewhere that has been completely had their, you know, a, a thumb down on them. They have not had the freedom and God is coming in and liberating some of those. And we need to look at the bigger picture because it's things that we're not going to understand. God's got a bigger plan for a lot of people here that is so much bigger than the group of people that we're around or maybe what we were raised around. He's doing something different in this day. The Bible says he's doing a new thing and it springs up now. And that's kind of where we're at. I think he's doing something new right now. God's doing a lot of work here. It's not about Melissa. It's not about Mark Taylor. It's not about any of us. It's about, you know, bringing people to the Lord. Uh, it's about getting people to free themselves from the encapsulation of the system, if you will, which would be uh, the church system, uh, the school system, you know, whatever the systems are, the systems are, are demonic. I mean, it's just, it's got people captured. It's got them in slavery. You know, God's on a mission here, and you've got to be able to see what God is doing on the earth right now, that heaven has an agenda, and that agenda is beginning to show up. This is called the Great Awakening, you know what I mean? And people are starting to see it. You know, I love what the president says, says all the time. He says, you know, you're going to get tired of winning. I don't think there is such a thing, you know? At least for me, there's not. Uh, and, I, and I do believe that. We are winning, and we're going to continue to win. We're going to go from victory to victory. Uh, and so people need to have hope. They, they need to... Get in the fight. Uh, you know, this, this thing's not over with. This is far from being over. And there's a lot that God wants to accomplish on the earth. And this is a rescue mission of epic proportions. This, is, uh, this war is, this is the greatest battle since the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, period.